morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to kick off today's event. I appreciate the opportunity to be the opening keynote speaker for a number of reasons. First, I am sure that it does not go unnoticed that my last name is Eisenberg. The same Eisenberg name affixed to your school building, the conference materials, shirts, hats, UMass blankets. To be honest, it can be a little creepy to see your name plastered everywhere. But I am indeed the daughter of Jean Eisenberg, for whom the Eisenberg School has been named. I appreciate the chance to honor his legacy. Secondly, I appreciate the invitation because unlike many of the speakers here who have distinguished and lucrative careers in business, I did not earn the money that allowed me to create Kenny Arth, our family office and foundation. I have spent the last three decades as a public health worker, a grade school teacher, a farmer, and a community advocate. Rewarding pursuits to be sure, but not the type of work that endows foundations and major universities. I have become the custodian of my family's wealth because I am my father's daughter. And finally, precisely because I am my father's daughter and not my father's son, I have been exposed to the inherent sexism barriers that exist in the world of business and finance that are experienced by all working women, whether they are the CEO of a major corporation or an entry-level analyst or account manager. I appreciate the chance to speak about these challenges in an open, supportive forum like this. I am grateful to be here in a room full of women of Eisenberg. My personal journey, like all of ours, is both typical and unique. Both of my parents were children of Jewish immigrants who settled here in Massachusetts on the north shore of Boston in Chelsea. My father did not grow up with much, and my childhood would be shaped by his relentless ambition to succeed. It was this public institution that gave him the higher education that was a stepping stone to his future. I was born, rather mundanely, in New Jersey, but soon left the United States as we followed my father's rising responsibilities around the world in the oil and gas business. We lived in London for two years, followed by six in Bangkok during the Vietnam War. Upon reflection, the most distinctive aspect of my youth was my delight and curiosity and people and things that were different. I reveled in eating Thai street food at a time when few had heard of Thailand, let alone considered it a tourist destination. My parents forged friendships with Thai locals that would last a lifetime. They showed me the value of respecting and embracing new cultures as an active participant, not a passive observer. I also subconsciously was, was absorbing my father's methodical approach to business. As I grew up, it was hard to miss. His office, when we moved back to New York City at the time I was 10, doubled as my bedroom. My father was not an idealistic innovator like the CEOs that our technology-obsessed world has come to emulate. Rather, he specialized in identifying badly run businesses, providing basic services, and turning them around. He did this in the old-fashioned way. He borrowed money from banks. At th that time, venture capital and private equity firms were non-existent, and unicorns were magical horse-like beasts, not iPhone apps with suspiciously calculated billion-dollar valuations. My preference today for bootstrapped enterprises and my deep suspicion for entrepreneurs pitching exponential growth, the dreaded hockey stick curve, is no doubt a legacy of observing my father's approach to business. Every dollar mattered, which is why I now have a strong affinity for enterprises that prioritize profitability as opposed to relying on steady streams of Silicon Valley type money. While I may have been taken in these lessons, I certainly did not follow directly in my father's footsteps. I did my undergraduate degree at Oberlin, a college where those pursuing careers in business are generally viewed as selling out to the capitalist oppressor. After Oberlin, I pursued a master's in public health at the University of Michigan that led me to a family planning and maternal child health care job in Bangladesh. The experience of spending day in and day out in poor rural villages gave me a visceral and acute awareness for the gross inequalities between developed and developing countries. My time in Bangladesh 
spent among populations that had little or no access to what I view as basic human rights, food, shelter, healthcare, water, sanitation, energy, education, and work, many of the beliefs that now underpin our work at Kenny Arth on rural livelihoods were forged from these early personal experiences. My life took a serendipitous turn when, while visiting the United Kingdom on leave from my work in Bangladesh, I met David, an upland livestock farmer, or a sheep farmer for those less familiar with agriculture. David would soon become my husband. Not only did I fall in love with David, but I fell in love with the small, tight-knit community where we live in Wales. Apart from my own childhood, this community, Mahuntleth, has been the greatest influence on my life and on my worldview. For the most part, my neighbors have little formal education beyond high school. Many remain self-employed in family businesses, running farms, small shops, and trades. Businesses that provide simple but critical services for everyday life. Businesses that depend heavily on relationships. Mahuntleth is a place where bartering and volunteering are common and frequently used in lieu of money. In a world where communities are increasingly splintering and where most urban consumers can order anything they wish to from the comfort of their homes, I live in a place defined by traditional values and neighborly goodwill. It is a place where I raise three children, all of whom have gone on to have meaningful professional careers. It is a place where I served as a teacher, fair trade educational representative, and active trustee at our children's local schools. When my children were toddlers, other mothers and I saw the community lacked a proper nursery for early child care needs. We founded one. I raised every penny through grants, and we developed a resource for everyone in the community that is still thriving today. Ironically, I think Mahuntleth was a place that my father understood. That is, after he got over what he saw as the completely crazy idea that his daughter had moved to a sheep farm in rural Wales. My father never forgot his humble origins, even though his life had strayed a long way from his childhood in Chelsea. At one point, David and I had hatched a plan to farm Angora goats. At the time, Angora goats were a hot commodity in the United Kingdom, with only a select number allotted for import from New Zealand. The price of Angora wool was rising, but nowhere near in correlation to the price of imported animals. One's best bet for success was not the obvious business of producing wool, but rather breeding these animals for sale to other farmers willing to pay high prices for the livestock. It was a classic bubble, only with goats instead of apps. When I rang my father to discuss the plan, he immediately rattled through a battery of questions that quickly exposed the fragility of the business. He had barely spent a day on a livestock farm, but to me, at the time, it seemed he possessed a magical ability to dissect the problem. It would only be decades later that I would realize that his magic was simply the product of a great consultative business mind. If my personal tale ended here, it might sound somewhat quaint and perhaps eccentric, but it would probably not land me on this stage. The reason that I am here today is that five years ago, due to my father's declining health, I suddenly found myself responsible for my family's assets. You can imagine that for someone who had spent decades living a rural life with little focus on money, that finding yourself responsible literally overnight for a huge amount of money might be, well, a bit shell-shocking. My personal journey and my values actually made this shocking event quite simple. While many wealthy families agonize over how much money to leave their children, how much to give to charity, and how much risk they are willing to take on their investments to have social impact, none of these questions emerged for me. There seemed little choice. I do not believe that multi-generational wealth is a birthright. I do not think that my grandchildren's children deserve to be rich because their great-great-grandfather was a rich man. I raised my children with the same values of thrift and hard work that my father was raised with and that I was taught. Two of my children are doctors in the United Kingdom, and my third child works in South Africa for a consulting firm focused on impact investing. I am proud to have three children who work in professions they find fulfilling and are making their own way in the world. 
Though I knew nothing about investing or portfolio management and had no idea what a startup or an exit was, I certainly understood that money was the essential ingredient for doing good, bad, or neutral in this world. I knew from the beginning that we would use the majority of our assets to help find solutions to livelihood challenges faced by billions of people living in rural poverty. My challenge was never what to do, but how. I had grown cynical through my work in traditional international development that sustainable solutions could be found through philanthropy or aid models. I was intrigued by new business-based approaches to poverty alleviation. I was drawn to the world of social enterprises and impact investing. While I had this vision and direction, I knew that I was significantly lacking in business acumen and would need a partner and a team to execute my vision. Unfortunately, the financial and wealth management world preys on people, women in particular, who lack business acumen. The average advisor from a major bank, or frankly, even from an average impact investing firm, bets on intimidating women into following their recommendations. They will ask you plenty of questions about your children and your personal interests, but they do not ask much about your vision for how to manage your money. This is their domain, and they will bet on most people accepting their expertise and following their recommendations. One of them had the audacity to condescendingly tell me that they could take care of everything so that I might have plenty of time to work in my garden. As you might guess, these people did not do well with me. For six months, I struggled through a string of misaligned encounters. First, with an executive from my father's world I thought might be a fit and whom I trusted. However, as we discussed his potential role as executive director of the family office, it became apparent that his financial ex compensation expectations were wildly out of line with mine. In addition, it was clear that he had his own agenda and saw our family money as a means of executing it. This was a dead end. Next, I trialed a boutique impact investment firm. It was quickly apparent to them I was a big fish and they were going to do everything they could to keep me in their pond. It was not in their interest for me to become too informed, too educated, too opinionated about what they were doing with my family's money. Strike two. Luckily, while beginning to bang my head against the wall with this stereotypical cast of characters, I was again struck by serendipity. At a conference, I met Greg Nietzsche. Greg would become my co-director and would help me shape Kenny Arth. Greg had all of the resume trappings of conventional business success. An economics degree from Dartmouth, an MBA from Wharton, a stint at an elite management consulting firm, and experience on the management teams of startups. But what really made him a fit, aside from being a bit eccentric himself, was that he had abandoned the conventional path of success to work on enterprises that he thought would make a difference in the world. Perhaps most importantly, it was clear from the very beginning that Greg's primary motivation was helping me to achieve my vision and empowering me to become a great leader. Whereas I brought a clear vision and field experience, Greg possessed the practical business frameworks that I needed to absorb. Greg quit his job, and we started Kenny Arth officially in November 2013. It has been quite the journey. Perhaps the most important conclusion that we have reached over the past five years is that you cannot have it all in the world of impact investing. Many mainstream impact investors now tout the fact you can have impact without sacrificing financial returns. In focusing on rural poverty, we have found the opposite to be true. In order to successfully invest in most of the geographies where we work, we must accept earning only modest returns. That said, we feel very confident that we will be able to recycle our capital to do continued good in the communities that we serve. Along the way, the importance of focusing on women and gender in all of our work has become more and more clear. In a recent article, I outlined that our gender lens strategy at Kenny Arth had three clear components. Number one, we invest in funds and enterprises that serve women as primary customers, and we assess their effectiveness in doing so. Our mission at Kenny Arth is to invest to improve rural livelihoods. Given the population and gender dynamics in many of the regions that we invest in, our mission is synonymous with investing in women. 
women as customers, entrepreneurs, service providers, advocates, and decision makers. Two examples are our investments in organizations like Pro Mahair, a network of microfinance institutions serving women as customers in Latin America, and Women's World Banking Capital Partners, a private equity fund supporting financial institutions that cater to women. Both were predicated on their explicit focus on women as customers for financial services. Women are at the heart of these places, and any funder hoping to make a lasting difference must have a gender lens to their work. Number two, we aim to pragmatically invest in diverse management teams, including women-led funds and enterprises. If a fund or an organization is demonstrating real success in addressing core issues core to our mission, and if they are doing so with thoughtfulness and integrity, we tend to reject dogmatic approaches to filtering them. We understand that in some parts of the world, it is incredibly challenging to build diverse, talented teams. The work of supporting rural communities should not go unfunded because an enterprise is having a difficult time finding qualified women managers. That said, when our investees do not have a woman on the management team, they better have a damn good reason for why they do not. There are numerous women-led funds and enterprises in our portfolio. For example, we are an early catalytic investor with advanced global capital a firm focused on factoring finance for small businesses in emerging markets. AGC was founded by Janet McKinley. Janet is a dynamic executive having spent 30 plus years managing some of the largest mutual funds in the United States. I was thrilled to support her as she turned her finance expertise towards having an impact on underserved businesses. In scanning our prospective pipeline of enterprise lending and fund investments, I am heartened by the number of talented women at the helm of many of these organizations. And finally, the third component of our gender lens strategy. I am committed to building a team at Kenny Arth that is made up predominantly of women. As a leader of my own family office, I have complete autonomy to shape our team. The investment field is ripe with sexism and gender-based discrimination, and impact investing is no exception. I know this because I have suffered through it over the past five years, even as a woman responsible for a vast sum of capital. If I am regularly condescended to, I can only assume what it is like for rank-and-file women working their way up the ladder. I own my own destiny, so I feel responsible for hiring a team that lifts up women in the field. That does not mean that we do not have men at Kenny Arth. We do, and from time to time, they're allowed to have an opinion. <laughs> As I noted, Greg Nietzsche is a good man and from day one has focused on empowering me to achieve my vision. And while I appreciate Greg and the other men on my team, I have been very active in recruiting women to Kenny Arth. Our women, including me, now outnumber our men seven to four. We still receive vastly more submissions from men for any open position, but the caliber of the women that we see in our hiring process is humbling. I know that our ability to attract incredibly talented women to our team is not only a product of our growing brand in the impact investing field, but it is also a product of having an office led and founded by a woman and an office with a majority of female employees. In addition, we have a variety of flexible work policies that are appreciated by women and men alike. In the pursuit of building diverse teams, success leads to more success. Before concluding, and hopefully taking some questions, I wanted to end with a few guiding insights that I thought might be useful as you head out into the workplace. Number one, expecting an organization to change when it comes to attitudes to, towards women is likely futile. Look for employers and organizations that are well on their way to being gender fair places to work. Look for teams that have women in management and in other key roles. Working for an organization that is not already on this path is going to be very frustrating. Number two, talented, ambitious women like yourselves are a valuable commodity in the market right now. I feel that a tipping point has been reached where many organizations are under pressure to achieve improved gender diversity. Hiring managers in almost every sector are desperate for more talented women. At Kenny Arth, we see resumes from men for our open positions vastly outnumber those from women, probably by a five to one ratio. Recognize your value in the market. Finally, number three, 
support each other in this continued struggle. I grew up in a women's movement where we stuck with our sisters. I am encouraged to see that the ranks of female leaders in our field is multi-generational. While millennials and Generation Z women, like all of you, are in the ascendance, it should not be forgotten that we all stand on the shoulders of previous generations. I am proud to see a broad representation of women leaders, some of whom started work as business professionals at a time when the only other women in the office would have been secretaries and cleaners. I recognize the complexity of the dialogue around women's issues has changed over the decades and that there are differing generational attitudes. That said, what unites us should be bigger than what divides us, and I am hopeful we can continue to listen and learn from each other. Lift each other up. Sure, we've come a long way in the past few decades, but the struggle for gender equality is far from finished. We are only going to succeed together. While I may indeed be, from a birthright perspective, one of the very first women of Eisenberg, I am thrilled and humbled to see, look out and see and see a sea of talented, strong, ambitious women of Eisenberg. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to taking questions.